Is the battle for Daraa decisive for the war in Syria? The province, which was the cradle of the Syrian revolution, is under massive bombardment. Would victory for the government signal an end to more than seven years of fighting? And what are the regional implications of the battle? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, it was anti-Assad graffiti in the city of Daraa that sparked Syria's revolution in 2011. But what started as a peaceful uprising has turned into a war that has killed hundreds of thousands and it's uprooted millions. It's drawn in an assortment of foreign powers and now, with the backing of Russia, Iran and the Lebanese militia Hezbollah, President Assad is seeking to retake control of Daraa, one of the last remaining rebel-held areas. Daraa is in the far southwest of Syria, and government forces have massed in the region. They're shelling and they're dropping barrel bombs, and some reports suggest that they're getting support from Russia in the air campaign. But this was supposed to be a de escalation zone, agreed by Russia, the United States, and Jordan. Well, that agreement's clearly now null and void, much to the consternation of neighboring countries. The US has reportedly told the Syrian rebels not to expect military support in southern Syria. So why is Dara so sensitive? Apart from its symbolic significance as the birthplace of the revolution, the province is considered strategically important. It's on the border with Jordan and it stretches all the way to the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights. And as we've mentioned, the US, Russia and Jordan agreed last year to include Dara as part of four so-called de-escalation zones designed to reduce the fighting in Syria. Well, Syria's government has urged rebels to give up their weapons, but so far they're refusing to recognize President Bashar al-Assad. We don't recognize Assad's authority. He has destroyed our cities and killed our people. He destroyed Syria to sustain power. We will never recognize him and we reject the presence of Iranian and Afghan militias. It's only Syrians who should decide the future of the country. All right, let's introduce our guests now. From Beirut, we have Sami Nada, who's director of the Levant Institute for Strategic Affairs. From London, we have Mahmoud Abu Nawar, retired Jordanian Air Force General. And from Arezzo in Italy, via Skype, Joshua Landis, director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. Can I start with you, Mahmoud, in London? Because the words there, we've just heard of that uh, FSA commander, suggest that any kind of political deal is not at all acceptable. They're not prepared to accept the authority of the government, of, of President Assad, so a battle is inevitable. My question, therefore, is what sort of support do the rebels have and are they likely to be completely wiped out from this? I, I think they lost the, the whole support from the region and from the American and their friends. Uh, uh, as the Americans suggested that they should put any assumption uh, that the American will interfere on that region or southern part of Jordan, uh, southern part of Syria. So I think they are in deep trouble. Uh, uh, if I wear them, I'll go, I'll stay on my land, uh, keep the current map as is, and uh, I will ask for reconciliation. Uh, that will be another route, and a lot of people will be killed if the uh, battle uh, stayed or remain on. And we, we see the, uh, also with the Russian air power, which is dominant force, and uh, I think they should proceed on that direction because they will lose it at the end of it. What, it's, what sort of, it's a what sort of, of time. What sort of weaponry, what sort of resources do they have at their disposal? They have light machinery and they don't have like heavy tanks or uh, air defense system, shoulder uh, uh, missile or uh, even they're short of these things and I don't think the American or the bordering country will support them. Uh, they should read that very carefully and they should uh, read the battle very carefully also and uh, took a decision on that. And uh, by uh, doing that, they, they would not give the regime a justification to keep on attacking them. 
and killing these people. I think he's, he's, he's the biggest dictator in our part of the world, and uh, I don't think the Syrian people got this revolution to make right. a political reform or whatever. Okay. They uh, want a regime change, and what the, the, the interviewer suggested that. All right. Uh, Joshua, is this uh, battle, the battle for Daraa, is this a definitive moment in Syria's war? Uh, it is. The war has largely come to an end. There are two major, three major pockets that remain, that this southern one that we're talking about now, Idlib, which Turkey may try to hold on to, and of course the large uh, Kurdish region in the north, and Kurdish and Arab region above the Euphrates, that the United States um, presently holds with its Kurdish and Arab allies up there. So those are the three areas that Assad has promised to take back. It's beginning with this one because it seems to be the most uh, least well defended and the, the most vulnerable because Jordan ultimately wants to open the roads with Damascus, wants to get back on a regular footing with Damascus. It wants to send refugees home. The United States is not going to defend this region. There are dozens of militias there, including ISIS and Al Qaeda. How would America, what would America's long term plan be if they intervened to save these militias? Would they help them establish a state? Would they protect them forever? It's unclear. And America has made it very, uh, you know, very, I think, very clear that it's not going to do that. Right. This de conflict arrangement was negotiated a year ago, to, more two years ago, when the United States wanted to fight ISIS. Today, ISIS is destroyed. So the, the object, which was to get Syria, Russia, the United States, and everybody focused on fighting ISIS, is now no longer there. And so that's why the Syrian regime has turned its uh, attention to taking it back. Right, OK. Uh, Sammy, coming to you, we heard in uh, the little clip from the FSA commander that uh, there are Afghan militias involved in the fight as well as, as the well-known uh, Iranian uh, militias taking part on the, on the side of the government. But this has been described as a potential powder keg for a regional, uh, a wider regional fight a battle which is alarming many, including the UN Secretary General. Um, why is Dara so sensitive an area in terms of the overall uh, region? Because uh, Dara in, is in the south and the south of uh, Syria is, uh, is the scene of confrontation between two major players, uh, uh, Israel and Iran. Let's not forget that uh, the south of Syria was subject to a de-escalation deal between Jordan, uh, Russia, and America that was uh, decided on in September of last year. It was confirmed during the summit between Putin and Trump uh, last November. And now this is a serious breach of uh, this deal. And at the core of this deal was the Iranian presence uh, in southern Syria. Israel's demand was that Iran has to be uh, uh, 40 to 50 kilometers fra far from this uh, border. This is the core of the deal. And today, this battle will decide the Iranian presence and uh, its capability to engage with Israel. Since day one, Iran was trying to change the rule of engagement uh, with uh, Israel. Uh, so now, uh, Russia is Russia testing the ability of America to defend this deal? Uh, is it uh, trying to uh, test the readiness of the FSA? Or there is a deal that has been already uh, 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 decided uh, on and Russia, which, uh, uh, according to which Iran will withdraw from the Israeli border. And in exchange of that, uh, Russia is claiming that this area will be under this all, his all right. control. Let's ask, Joshua, what do you think of that? Sami seems to suggest that perhaps uh, there is a deal that can pull 
uh, all of the parties to the conflict back from the brink? Or do you think that they are basically just ignoring the warnings that have been given by the United States that it's prepared to take firm and appropriate measures if the regime continues to, to uh, create violence in what is supposed to be this de-escalation zone? And what do you think? Well, uh, I don't think that they really have come to a, a deal. I think they have talked around the parameters, as your guest just explained. But Iran has said we're staying. Um, Israel has demanded that they leave altogether. There doesn't seem to be any final agreement. On the other hand, um, it seems quite clear that Israel is capable of uh, drawing red lines in Syria. It has attacked the Iranians in the north, up near Bukh Kamal in the south, it has been very successful in uh, destroying all of the potential Iranian uh, bases, missile implants, and so forth. The United States, I think, is not stepping in and has made it clear it will not step in because it believes that Israel is perfectly capable of defending itself in this region, that its air force and its, and its uh, technology is far superior to the Iranians. Now, that doesn't mean that the Iranians are going to sit back. They may continue to probe. We just saw, you know, in the last 24 hours that a drone was sent towards the Golan. Israel uh, sent up rockets against it. It turned around. There is going to be this kind of jousting, I believe, and Iran is repositioning itself. But Israel is quite capable and certainly very able uh, to attack Syria at will. And I, I don't think that anybody's really worried that Israel is going to be pushed into the sea All anytime right. soon. All right. Mamoun, uh, uh, Joshua has described what, uh, what could happen to be a, a series of joustings, if you like. Um, but at the end of the day, it is small, fragile Jordan that is going to bear the brunt of any escalation of uh, the conflict in this particular region. How fragile is Jordan at this moment? Very fragile. And uh, with all uh, respect, uh, I disagree fully with your previous speak speaker about uh, the assessment in Syria. The escalation zone never meant that it's a safe haven or demoralized zone. And what it meant really is staying, uh, Assad stay in power and regain the territory for him. Uh, help the Iranian uh, expansion in our part of the world. Israeli get limited capability to stop the Iranian maneuverability in the area or uh, politically and militarily. So uh, the de-escalation zone has no meaning now after the uh, regime got their back. For Jordan, yes, uh, it's a matter of time and they will get, regain the Nasib crossing. Uh, 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 area to Jordan, that's a very important crossing point. And uh, the main concern of Jordan is the chaos and the refugees. With our internal problem now concerning economy and uh, some instability, I could say, in Jordan now, uh, regarding uh, changing prime minister, etc., with all this influx of refugees, uh, that will be a big trouble. Uh, uh, affect our demography and our way of life and our economy also. Absolutely. I mean, we've all seen those. Yeah, we've all Jordan. seen those, those so, uh, demonstrations. So Jordan plan, you know, may I, may I carry on on about, about 10 or 5 seconds only? Uh, war never been uh, based on promises and guarantee as the American uh, uh, way of doing things, uh, promising the rebels initially and all of a sudden they cut them back and this is the way they do it. Also for Jordan, they should not base their strategy on promises and, uh, and, and guarantee from the American. And they should have a plan B to stop or force a, a, a safe haven for these refugees because Jordan cannot take it anymore. And it's a very difficult situation now we are in. Absolutely. And Sammy, because, of course, uh, we shouldn't lose sight, should we, of the fact that there are civilians who are pretty much pinned in. They've got a, a closed border with Jordan and they've got uh, an encroaching military attack uh, coming their way. What do they do? What do these hundreds of thousands of civilians do? Yeah, exactly. In Dara, you have more than 800,000 civilians living uh, there. And if uh, these uh, military uh, developments will lead to a new flood of refugees to, to Jordan, 
Jordan, it's like Lebanon in a very fragile uh, situation, not uh, uh, only politically like in Lebanon, but economically. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, an economic uh, collapse of uh, two regions or two countries that are bordering uh, Syria. And if this is uh, to happen, it will have uh, really very damaging uh, consequences on uh, all the region. We have seen that uh, about 2 million refugees threatened the whole Europe of, uh, I would not say collapse, but put Europe in big trouble. In Jordan and Lebanon, we are talking about like 4 million uh, uh, Syrian refugees for a total population of 6 to 8 million. So this is to put uh, things in, in perspective. Uh, I think uh, the Secretary of the United Nations uh, has had like wise word in saying that this has to stop at least to, uh, uh, to contain uh, or to stop a possible uh, new flood of refugees that will have uh, very damaging uh, consequences on all the region. Absolutely. So, Joshua, how can this be averted? I'm particularly taken by uh, a report by the International Crisis Group, which suggests uh, that given that the rebels cannot mount any kind of credible military defence, uh, they need to be party to some sort of agreement, some sort of deal, whereby the state, the state of, of President Assad, retakes control of the area uh, and they agree on how to be governed. Yes, the, the International Crisis Group put out a very good report. It, it foresaw that the reality is that you are drawn out in this program, which is that there could be a big flood of refugees into Jordan, which could destabilize the region. And it hoped that America would put pressure on the refugees to withdraw, um, to withdraw from the region and not to put up a fight so that it would not turn into the Huta. The problem with this, however, is that the rebels are determined to stay in place. At least that's what they've said. And I think that they're trying to use the anxiety and the leverage of a potential flood of refugees into Jordan in order to get the United States and local powers to step in to put pressure on Assad and to try to use that as leverage. And so this is a game of chicken that we're seeing right now. Um, you know, everybody agrees that the rebels do not uh, uh, have the balance of power in their favor, that they can't survive, but they want better terms. They want somebody to come in and provide them with guarantees, um, which will be negotiable. And, and how we get there, it's unclear. What the Americans can guarantee them, whether it's money, whether it's a safe haven someplace, I don't know. And uh, Mahmoud, it seems very much as though time is, is certainly not on their side. Barrel bombs are already being dropped. And uh, we're under, we understand that Russian uh, warplanes have taken to the skies as well. Uh, so this war uh, for Dara is actually underway, isn't it? So how long do you think it will take before the region is devastated? And we see this humanitarian crisis that Sami has already outlined. It's very difficult to predict uh when the war in southern Dara or in Dara will be over. But I, I think the uh, Russian engineer, engineered uh, uh, sort of understanding with the Israeli that the, allowed the Syrian army to come to buffer zone 1974 nearby the uh, goal line. Uh, in Jordan, which is the most critical thing, if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm a planner there, I would not uh, rely on American guarantee and promises regarding that. I should have plan B uh, by asking uh, the whole international community to go for safe haven for these refugees nearby the Jordanian bo border. I think this is the least Jordan can do, and they should clearly tell the world that we cannot can take any more uh, uh, Syrian into our part of the world, though they are our brethren, but that would be Absol absolutely. We, we understand the pressure, and, region. and and Sami, obviously the same for, for your country, isn't it? For for, for Lebanon, the the pressure of of this uh, flood of desperate people is almost too much to bear. What alternatives do you see? What sort of pressure can be brought to bear? Do you think that could avert this military conflagration that we seem to be witnessing already? 
I think that the, the only solution, the one on, on, and only solution for this refugee crisis is to ensure uh, safe zones in Syria and to ensure, I mean, a safe return for uh, those uh, refugees. But the fighting uh, has to now, stop, doesn't big, it, Sami? Uh, the fighting has to stop. The, the fighting has to has to stop. This is true, but in some region of uh, Syria, the fighting has been stopped. In practically all of North Syria, there is uh, no fighting anymore, and uh, serious effort can be uh, done to ensure at least uh, the return of uh, uh, some of those uh, refugees. Uh, 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 perhaps not all of them, but uh, uh, some of them. And the same could be said for the region of Homs and of Damascus. But the question is, given that this re-engineering of Syria, the demographic re-engineering of Syria, is this question of the return of the, refu of the refugees is really on the table? Or uh, there is a poker game uh, here that uh, we're uh, uh, that we're hearing some diplomatic words, but but on the ground we are witnessing a different reality, a partition of Syria, uh, or a re-engineering uh, of Syria based on new demographic and uh, ethnic rules. Absolutely, Joshua. That's an interesting point, isn't it? Because the shifting of demographies has been uh, one of the ca characteristics of this war, uh, and many people, of course, are, are loath to give up. Uh, the, the region in which they live and be forcibly moved to another part of the country completely, which has happened in Ghouta and, and other places as well. And they're all being uh, fenced in almost in Idlib province in the northwest of the country. Uh, this is one of the great fears, isn't it, of civilians? Absolutely. And, and everybody knows that when the regime returns, uh, one has to give up their political rights and they will no longer have freedom of expression and they'll be frightened that those who have joined the revolution, who have supported it openly, will possibly be jailed and, and discriminated against. This is, this is, of course, the terrible fear. And we, we see it, you know, the, the big question is, will refugees return to Syria if there's not regime change? And, and many analysts are very uh, divided on this question. We've seen many reports by the Carnegie Foundation and others saying that Refugees will not return as long as so long as Assad stays in power. I've heard many others say I, they're skeptical of this. If the economy stability were to um, return to some some sort of stability and normalcy, that people might go back because conditions are not good in Lebanon. Uh, many people don't want to live in Turkey. The Turks are trying to push them out. The Jordanians are trying to push them out. So it's unclear what the international community, what stand it should take. Because the United States and many others have said they're not going to help rebuild. They don't want to help the economy. This will only consolidate Assad's power, re-legitimize him, and not lead to regime change. The United States is still, uh, at least orally, says that it wants, ultimately, Assad to leave through elections. And it's going to put pressure on, economic pressure. So this. This bigger question and is still up in the air, and, the, and it's the civilians down below who are being caught in this clash between rebel and regime, and between the West and the East, Iran and Saudi, and Saudi Arabia. So the people of Syria are still not out of the woods. A cold, hard fact on which to end this conversation. Gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. Sami Nada uh, talking to us from Beirut, Mahmoud Abu Noir talking to us from London, and Joshua Landis talking to us from Arezzo in Italy. Thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the programme again anytime you like by going to the website. Aljazeera.com is the address. Should you want more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here, it's bye for now. <laughs>